Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Janssen. I'm the Senior Vice President for Design and Development. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to spend some time with you this morning to talk about Cutler's product portfolio, uh, the products that we just have released, and also the products that we have in the pipeline. So as Chris uh, shared the mission with you this morning, yeah, uh, you know that our mission is about uh, help people hear and be heard. And the third element of the way we implement that mission is really about innovation. And that's what this talk is going to be about. It's about bringing to market a arrangement plan for hearing solutions that provide a lifetime of hearing outcomes. Now, the activities that we undertake at Cochlear in the research and development uh, area start all the way from looking at basic research, basic technologies that are emerging around the world. Some of that work we do in-house, but very much so we, we observe what's happening in basic hearing science, what's happening in basic technologies. When we deem that these evolutions of these developments have come to a level that they can be taken into cochlear, we will take them into applied research in cochlear or into internal technology development. Sometimes we actually go to intermediate step before we develop an actual product, and we develop what's called an investigational device, which, is, which allows us to do a proof of concept of a novel uh, therapy before we put it into product development. The bulk of our activity, of course, in research and development is the actual product development. And so the activities that you see leading up to it, all the, their purpose is really to feed in new technologies, new algorithms, new innovations into our product pipeline. Alongside the product development, we undertake very significant clinical validation to establish the safety and effectiveness of the device before we eventually then release the products uh, to market. The whole process is very strongly governed through what we call our product innovation process. You see the, the wheel here. Uh, and we will go through that product innovation process anywhere between six, uh, from six months or 12 months if we talk about a new piece of software that we're releasing, which we do on a very regular cadence, versus three to five years as we develop new sound processors, or even three to seven years as we develop new implants. And also very important in the whole R&D space, of course, is what we call post-market studies. So it's important that after we've established, after we've released the product on the market, that we keep tracking the performance of that product and that we uh, gain confidence, we build further confidence about the effectiveness of the device for cochlear, but also for reimbursers and for regulatory bodies around the world. And later I will talk about a specific study uh, that we are undertaking uh, about uh, with the new uh, electrode array that we just released in September last year. To implement our innovation strategy, we've established a global innovation network. We employ over 350 people around the world, the majority here in Sydney, where we have over 200 people working in this building on new innovations. And of course, we co-located with the Australian Hearing Hub across the road. Another important uh, element of our innovation strategy is the collaboration that we have with many of our customers. A lot of our professional customers work in university clinics and make a significant contribution to new evolutions and new developments through the collaborative research that we undertake with them. And last but not least, there's also a very expanded uh, uh, supplier network and design partner network that we work with around the world to make sure that we have uh, cutting edge technologies that we can integrate into our products. As you know, Cochlear's commitment to research and development has been very strong from the beginning and, continues, and continues to be very strong uh, every day. And in fact, in uh, fiscal 16, Cochlear invested over $140 million, around 12% of our revenues, into research and development. Yeah, now, that number does include also our clinical, regulatory, and quality activities, but I think it's a testament to how serious Cochlear's innovation commitment uh, has been and continues to be going forward. Now, a question that we often get is how, how do you decide, Cochlear, what, what are the new products, what are the new innovations you're going to invest in? And I thought it's, it's probably worthwhile including one slide to share with you our philosophy in how we do that. It all starts with deep customer insight. And in fact, I would say Cochlear's success story, which started with Professor Graham Clark, actually very much started from the fact that Professor Clark's father was hearing impaired. Yeah. So he had first-hand insight in what hearing impairment actually meant uh, to people and was a big driver for him to undertake his research in the 70s uh, into, into the early development of the cochlear implant. So it all starts with deep customer insights. And it's great to hear from Dean uh, uh, this morning that we're further building that capability in cochlear to be more and more refined in understanding the specific insights for different customer segments that we're trying to serve. The other element, of course, is the market insights. That is how the reimbursement models work. What do professionals think about the, uh, the, uh, the strategy? What are new clinical models that are emerging? 
The third element in this balancing act is the technology feasibility, because we may very well know what we'd like to achieve for our customers, but it just may not be possible at the point in time because the underlying technology may not be mature enough. Okay? So a lot is about choosing the right timing to introduce particular new technologies into our products. And then the final element, of course, is the, uh, the financial commitment. Okay? And so we have an annual process, an annual product planning process that's very cross-functional. It involves, involves the regions, it involves manufacturing, marketing, research and development, where we update our plans for the coming years. And we just went through that cycle again in March, where we've updated our product plan and our product roadmap for the coming five years. The next uh, part of my presentation is really to give you a bit of an update of some of the new products that we've released and give you a bit more background uh, about those products. We have, as we showed last year, a very strong portfolio uh, with our uh, nucleus profile implants, with the nucleus six sound processors and associated accessories, as well as with the clinical uh, care tools that support these products. And over the last 12 months, uh, we did uh, introduce two significant new products uh, that today very much form part of our premium product offering. The first one is the new uh, electrode array, uh, the uh, slimmer dialer. I'll go a bit more in detail on that one, as well as the Canso of the ear sound processor. So let's start with the Nucleus Profile with this new slimmer dialer electrode array. And let me start by giving you a bit of background in terms of the type of indications that are being treated with uh, cochlear implants. We have the conventional severe profound segment. So these are the people that basically have lost most of their hearing and really don't benefit at all from a hearing aid anymore. Then the second category, which is an emerging category, are people who have lost the same level of hearing in the higher frequencies, but still have some usable low frequency hearing. Okay? And then there's a special category with people with special needs. I won't spend too much time on that category today. So these traditional candidates still form the bulk of our, of the people that are being implanted, but more and more we see people implanted that have this level of residual hearing, yeah, which we call, which we then treat with what we call hybrid hearing, because it's a combination between electrical stimulation to treat the high frequency loss and acoustic stimulation for the low frequency loss. And that's, uh, that classification is important because it has an impact on the electrodes uh, selection for the different segments. So here we have the three segments, and the requirement really for the traditional uh, CI candidates is that we can optimize the electrical stimulation as good as possible. Okay. And that's why we introduced about 15 years ago this device, the Contour Advanced Electrode, and I'll explain a bit later uh, what the benefits of that type of uh, electrode are. Okay. While for the hybrid hearing candidates, really there the objective is to maximize that residual hearing, because if we can maximize and preserve that residual hearing, we know that people get benefits from that when they listen to noise, when they listen to music, yeah? and overall they, they do better if we can use that low frequency residual hearing. Okay? And that's, for that uh, segment, we released a number of years ago what we call the slim straight electrode. And then again, we have the special cases. So if we look at it from a different angle, from the different types of electrodes, then there's really two types of electrodes that we've seen uh, in the CI industry. It all started with what were called lateral wall electrodes. So these are electrodes that you can see who sit to the outer wall or next to the outer wall of the cochlea, which is called the lateral wall. Okay, that's where cochlear implant technology started. Okay. But the, the neural tissue that we're stimulating with the electrodes is actually at the middle of the cochlea, which is called the medialis. Okay. So it makes a lot more sense to put the electrodes close to the medialis. And that's why 15 years ago, cochlear pioneered the introduction um, with the contour advanced electrode, which was the industry's first yeah. uh, paramedial electrode. Yeah. And you can see that uh, in this picture here, you see a cross section of a cochlea. So imagine a cut through there. And you see here the contour advanced electrode, which is a paramedial electrode sitting next to, okay, very close to the medialis, where the neural tissue are, it's called the spiral, uh, the spiral ganglion cells. That's the tissue that we stimulate with the, with the electrode. And that's really where you want to be if you want to optimize electrical stimulation. Now with the emergence, however, of people that have a level of residual hearing, it's also very important to have a very thin and delicate electrode. Okay? And that's why we introduced five years ago the slim, the slim straight electrode. Okay? So you see that is a lateral wall electrode. So you could say it's not as ideal from a location perspective, but it has the benefit of being very thin and flexible and having a good opportunity to preserve that residual hearing for people that have residual hearing. So those are basically the two types that we had on the market uh, until uh, about uh, nine months ago and, and made up uh, well over 90% of our sales. 
And here you see, if, uh, if you could play the video in the back here, here you can actually can see a, a cochlea, sorry, a human cochlea, sorry, let me go back. You can, uh, sorry, could you play the video again? Yep. A human cochlea, and you see here the electrode going in. Uh, this is a lateral wall electrode, so it goes at the outer wall of the cochlea, uh, and see here it's going in. Yeah. And I thought it would be useful for you to get an idea yeah, of, a, of a real cochlea. This is a real human cochlea, and an electrode actually going into that, uh, into that cochlea. There's a very thin membrane that you see under which the electrode uh, moves forward. Uh, that's really the part of the cochlea that you, want to, that you want to protect and preserve. It's called the basilar membrane, and if you rupture that basilar membrane, then you will lose that residual hearing, uh, which is why it's so important to have these very thin electrodes uh, for people that have a level of residual hearing. Now, of course, what we ideally would like to do or wanted to do is have an electrode that is N-thin, as the one as the slim straight electrode, but then in the right location. Yeah. So we wanted an electrode that is slim, but around the modiolus. And that's how we came up with the slim modiolus electrode. And to see or to demonstrate that we've succeeded in that endeavor, you see here one patient that was implanted with two implants. On one ear, one ear is implanted with the slim straight electrode. You see that uh, here. And in the other ear, he's implanted with the slim modiolus electrode. And you can see how much more tight the slim modiolus electrode is, how much closer it is to the neural tissue that we're trying to stimulate, which is in the middle of that, uh, of that electrode array. So we're very proud that we could launch the, uh, the CI532, which is the product, uh, mo the model number of the, uh, of the slim modular electrode in September last year, because it is by far the slimmest ferromodular electrode. We actually removed 60% of the volume compared to the Contour Advanced. It's, it provides us with consistent, excuse me, consistent ferromodular placement. You can see that here, how thin it is and, and nicely uh, positioned around the modulus. And also we paid great attention to make sure that it's easy to insert from a surgical perspective. So today yeah. we went uh, with, or today uh, we have a slim modular electrode that combines the best of both worlds that is in the right position yeah, where you want to stimulate and has the same soft uh, and atraumatic nature as we have with the, uh, the slim straight electrodes in the bottom here. We still are selling the uh, contour advanced electrodes that's typically at lower tiers or in some markets where the slim straight, where the slim modular electrode has not been approved yet. So to come back to this picture, yeah, so the electrode choice that we now know in our primary markets is the slim modular electrode as the electrode of choice yeah, for uh, people that have severe or profound hearing loss where we want to optimize the electrical stimulation and the slim straight for hearing preservation candidates. We do expect also actually good outcomes with respect to hearing preservation of the slim modular electrode. And the, there's anecdotal feedback we have from a number of professionals that they have been able to achieve that. In fact, uh, Brian Kaplan will talk to me later, uh, will present to you later today, just recently reported that he had excellent outcomes in terms of hearing preservation with the new uh, slim modular electrode, but to date it's still very much anecdotal feedback. So we don't want to make strong claims on that, uh, on that benefit uh, yet. The uh, other element that is worth mentioning before I go off the electrode is that uh, we actually are undertaking a large, what we call benchmark trial. We are implanting over 100 people with the slim modular electrode uh, to reestablish a new benchmark of hearing performance because we strongly believe that with this device we will surpass the hearing performance that, that uh, has been achieved with earlier generations of devices. And so the study that we are undertaking in the US with 100 people will able to uh, provide us the clinical data to strengthen that claim. And we'll be able to report to you uh, about that study in about 18 months from now. And then before we move to the sound processor, a final slide on the implants, which I think is a really important slide. And that is about implant reliability. As you know, implant reliability has been very important for Cochlear from day one. Yeah. We did, of course, have our uh, uh, incident in terms of reliability a number of years ago, but we worked really, really hard as we reintroduced that product back into the market in 2014, yeah, as then the Nucleus Profile. And you can see here that we have achieved stellar results in terms of reliability with the reintroduced yeah, Nucleus Profile. We have achieved 99.94% .94 cumulative survival yeah, after three years. That means that only one in 1,600 people would have lost their implant because of an implant failure after three years. This is unseen in the industry and multiple times better than any competitor device that is out there in the market. So I know it took a few years for us to get the product back to the market, but now you see that the efforts to do so really have paid off and we've set a new benchmark in terms of implant reliability. 
The other new product, of course, that we introduced is the Council Sound Processor. And I wanted to take a bit, uh, I want to take the opportunity to give you a bit of background on the development of the Council. So 30 years ago, cochlear implants had body-worn sound processors. Okay? So they were not even behind the ear. So people were wearing a little box on their belt and then they had a cable going up and a microphone up their ear. About 20 years ago, we saw the introduction of behind the ear processors, and now with Canso, we're introducing off the ear processors. And um, so typically a sound processor will have a processor unit, you see here, a battery module, and a coil. So these are the three essential components of a behind the ear sound processor. And for people that have residual hearing, they can also plug in this acoustic component. But that's really optional if you have residual hearing and you want to use that. So what we needed to do for Canso is really move these components all together. So we had to take the, the processor module, which has the microphones and the, the microchip doing the signal processing, move that into the coil as well as the battery module. Okay. So we had to combine all these three things together okay, and then put a nicer case around it. And that really is what has delivered the Canso uh, of the ear sound processor. Okay. So it's, it's a very smart, simple device yeah. that uh, people can wear yeah. of their ear at the same time, people still have the option to use an on the ear or a behind the ear sound processor with the Nucleus 6 uh, sound processor. And when we designed the process, we really want to make sure uh, that we, we, we met three key design objectives. The first one that that is that the device is very smart. We didn't want to compromise any hearing performance benefits with the Canso compared to Nucleus 6. So we made sure we introduced two microphones, the dual microphone technology that's that we have in Nucleus 6, the automation that comes with that, and important also the full wireless suite because we know that makes such a big difference in people's lives. But also we know that for this segment in particular, it's really important that the device is simple to use. Okay, so we went from two buttons to one button okay, and we largely automated all the controls. So in the processor, there's an algorithm which we call scan that will continuously uh, monitor the environment in which the patient is and then automatically select the right settings for that environment so that we minimize the need for the patient or for the user to interact uh, with their sound processor. And then of course, also for this segment, very important is that it is free, which is why we made this product available in eight colors, a bit more than we normally do, so it can nicely blend in with hair colors of our recipients. And as I mentioned, we really were uh, focused to make sure that there's no compromise in hearing performance. And by implementing the dual microphone technology, we had to make some tweaks in, in terms of the signal processing because of course the process is a bit further to the back, yeah, we achieved to meet that goal uh, that we can stay, uh, that we can claim that the cancer of the ear sound processor delivers uncompromised, uncompromised hearing performance compared to the Nucleus 6 behind the ear sound processor. And it's worth, I think, calling that out because there are, or there has, there's one other of the ear sound processor that, that is in the market from a competitor, but with that product, there's a significant difference yeah, with their uh, behind the ear sound processor. And that's not something that we thought was the right thing to do for our candidate. Then the third section of the presentation this morning is to give you a bit more background around our acoustic implant portfolio. It's a smaller part of our portfolio, but a very important part. It all started with the acquisition of Antific, a company in Sweden in 2005 uh, that uh, provided Cochlear with an additional product line, the Baja product line. Uh, and so the, uh, there's many forms of hearing loss, as you know, uh, and there's many places along the hearing pathway where we can intervene. And so the bone conduction or the Baja products, yeah. they really deal with specific forms of hearing loss. So, uh, there's basically three forms of hearing loss that are being treated with Baja. The first one is called conductive hearing loss. That means that actually your cochlea is in perfect shape. Okay. But the problem is that the sound doesn't get there because it may be that you were born without an ear canal. It may be that you have an ear canal, but your ossicular, your, uh, ossicular chain, the little bones in the cochlea or malfunctioning or they've ossified and they can't convey the vibrations to, to the cochlea anymore. So that's the first form of hearing loss that's being treated with Baja. The second form is what we call mixed hearing loss. That is where you have a combination of conductive hearing loss plus a level of hearing loss also in the cochlea. Not as bad as what you have when you get a cochlear implant, but say a mild to moderate level of hearing loss in the cochlea. And that's what we call mixed hearing loss. And then the third category that's been treated with Baja is called single-sided deafness. And I'll explain a bit later uh, how that works. So the way that the Baja uh, or bone conduction implant works is that there's an external sound processor, which you can see here, that captures the sound via microphone. And in the, in the sound processor, there's a little actuator, a little vibrator, 
that makes that little box that you wear on the side of your head vibrate. And through that vibration, yeah. that is conveyed then to the skull through the abutment and the implant, yeah. you see the implant is the part that actually sits in the bone, yeah. um, we, we, we transfer the vibrations, the sound vibrations onto the skull, and then through the skull, they make their way to the cochlea. Yeah. So it's a kind of an alternative way. We actually go through the back door, if you want, to put the vibrations uh, to, the, uh, to the cochlea. The basic technology comes out of dental implants. It's very similar to what you have with a dental implant. The only reason why dental implants actually work is because the titanium that's used in a dental implant actually integrates with the bone. Yeah. So it really forms one piece. And we have the same with, with Baha, we call that osseointegration, yeah. where the, the, implant, uh, the implant, which looks like a screw, sits in the bone, yeah. it integrates with that bone, and you have the abutment that then uh, goes through the skin upon which the, the external sound processor is, is snapped onto. So that's basic principle of how Baha typically works. Now, as I mentioned, one of the indications for Baha is single-sided deafness. Yeah. So that means that, say, if this, if this person would be deaf at his right ear here, yeah. it would mean that he would get no sound input. And that means that if you uh, sit in a meeting, for example, is that the person to your right is really difficult to understand. You're gonna have to turn around all the time to understand the person. So the way that Baha can address that is by implanting that patient with the Baha near his right ear, although this ear is completely deaf, but the vibrations will actually make their way through the skull and will mix in into the healthy cochlea at the other side. Yeah. And then so that way, BA is a very effective way to treat single-sided deafness. And in fact, in the United States, uh, this, uh, uh, that indication for BA is actually the largest part of the uh, BAHA uh, applications uh, in the US. Then traditionally, um, so I've just spoken about the indications. Traditionally, we had the implant um, that goes in the bone and then the abutment that goes through the skin. A number of years ago, we, we offered a second, uh, a second alternative, or an alternative to that skin penetration, which is a magnet coupling. So in that case, there's no part that goes through the skin, but there's a magnet that is uh, placed on that implant, which is under the skin, and then there's an external magnet yeah. that of course snaps onto that, and it's the magnet coupling that conveys the vibrations from the processor to the skull. And that's what we call Baha Attract. So that's a second way in how we can apply uh, bone connection. And so also, as we've innovated strongly in cochlear implants, we've done uh, the same in Baha. So since cochlear acquired in TIFIC in 2005, we had a continuous stream of innovation. In particular, the last generation that we've put out, Baha 5, has been extremely successful. Yeah. So this gives you a total overview of the Baha portfolio. Here you see the, the implant, that's the part that goes in the bone. For a conventional Baha, called the Baha Connect. This is the part that goes through the skin, yeah. and you see this, th that's the part on which then the sound processor is snapped on. And here you see the Baha Track system, which is the magnet coupling, which is the alternative to the, uh, the Baha Connect. And so over the last two years, we released an entire new suite of Baha sound processors. It started with the Baha 5 sound processor, which we released about uh, almost two years ago now. But uh, over the last uh, 12 months, we also added two other attractive products, uh, which is called the Baha 5 Power, yeah. which basically the same operating principle, but can, can um, provide stronger power, stronger vibration to overcome higher levels of mixed hearing loss. And we even have now what's called the Baha 5 Superpower, uh, excuse me, um, that then complements the whole portfolio. Yeah. They're all built on a novel actuator technology, which allows us to have a much stronger output in a much smaller package. And the size of the Baha 5, which is smaller than any other product on the market, together with the uh, the device connectivity, those two elements really have driven the, the success of Baha. And uh, the device connectivity that we have achieved with, excuse me, keep pressing the wrong button here, uh, the, but the device connectivity to the iPhone is really one of the unique features that Cochlear is providing there because it allows recipients to pick up a phone call to listen to music straight from their iPhone to their Baha 5 sound processor. Any of those Baha 5, 5 Power, Super Power, all have that same made for iPhone uh, capability. And also, we know that of course not everyone is using iPhones. Also over the last 12 months, we re did release an Android app. Now with the Android phones, we cannot stream audio. It's a limitation of Android, not of our devices. Um, but what is possible of course for Android users with the smart app is then to control their Baja device through their uh, Android uh, smartphone. And that brings me then to the last part of the, uh, of the session, which is really to give you a bit of an outlook where we're going for the future. 
I'd like to start by actually making the observation that we have come a very long way. Cochrane has been 35 years in business, and through those 35 years, we've seen continued improvements of hearing outcomes, not only in quiet, but also in the real world, particularly with the introduction of the dual microphone technology. And we've then added the wireless technology to make it even better for people to deal with difficult listening situations in classrooms, in restaurants, in a car, etc. But also, of course, we've, we've made significant steps forward in making the device more lifestyle friendly. As we heard, I think, today from Stu earlier today, people just want to get on with their life. They want to have their hearing back and then want to have as minimal hassle as possible with their device. Yeah. So also there we've seen significant progress over the last 35 years. And of course, in the implant area, we've made the electrodes thinner, uh, more atraumatic so we can preserve residual hearing, but we've made the implants smaller, thinner, so that also the surgery goes faster. Many people actually do surgery now in well under an hour, and more and more we even hear people that start to do surgery under local anesthesia rather than under general anesthesia. That's not mainstream yet, by no stretch of the imagination, but those are things that definitely going forward could help drive penetration of uh, implantable hearing technology. So we've made the products better, we brought them to portfolio, However, as we saw on Chris's slide earlier, we're actually not anywhere near where we need to be. Yeah. We are treating less than 5% of people with implantable hearing that could benefit from it. And so we also need to think from a technology perspective, why is that the case? And it is because it's still very much an obstacle race. There's many obstacles that people have to jump over before they get to an implantable solution. Now, some of those have very little to do with technology. Yeah. Uh, as Dean, as we heard from Dean, it's with, with awareness and access, but there's all significant improvements we believe we can still make in the technology that will lower these hurdles going forward. The smaller the implant will get, the shorter the surgery will be. The shorter the surgery, the more people may not have to go under, under general anesthetic, et cetera. And so our objective is really also for technology to play a role in establish what we want to do over the coming 10 years, which is make implantable solutions the standard of care. To do that, we're focusing on four areas. Hearing outcomes, lifestyle, connected care, and hearing indications. And I'll go a bit more in detail on these to wrap up the presentation. In terms of hearing outcomes, you heard from the, uh, uh, from the recipient earlier, is that losing hearing is not, is not easy, getting it back is not easy either. Yeah. Our products do fantastic things, but it doesn't come easy yet. Yeah. So what we wanted to do is really, as much as possible, close the gap that's still there between hearing outcomes for uh, people with cochlear implants versus normal hearing people. And as much of that is not only how well they do, but how quickly they get there. What's the effort that people have to put in in terms of rehab? The more we can make electrical stimulation like normal hearing, the less rehab that will be needed, the faster people will just get a device and move on with their life. The second area is the, um, the preservation of residual hearing. Yeah. As we heard earlier, that's an emerging a group of people that's being implanted that has levels of residual hearing, so it's really important that we can do better and better in preserving that. With the slimmer dieter electrode, with the slim straight electrode for sure, we do think that the electrode has come a long way in terms of preserving that residual hearing, but we know that down the track sometimes people still lose residual hearing. And actually the remote control is falling apart, so if you could provide a little bit here. Okay, yeah. And so one of, the, one of the avenues that we are pursuing to better preserve that residual hearing over time is by embedding drugs into the cochlear implant. Yeah. We already have done a first trial to do that with promising results, and we strongly believe that that is a direction for the future, that by embedding drugs into a cochlear implant electrode that we will be better in preserving and hopefully one day guaranteeing that preservation of residual hearing, which we know is a factor when people are considering getting a cochlear implant, in, in particular those who have a significant level of residual hearing. Yeah. So it is definitely something important for future market growth, we believe. Then of course we want to continue to evolve our wireless technology. You've already seen in Baja, the made for iPhone, and we of course want to bring that technology also into our cochlear implant portfolio going forward. And then the last element in terms of hearing outcomes is to make sure that people hear with two ears. And that has a policy component to it. We definitely need to work with reimbursers to make sure they reimburse uh, uh, hearing in two ears, either with two cochlear implants, or uh, for people that have good enough hearing at the other ear with a hearing aid. And that's why the GN Resound relationship is so important to us. Yeah. Because we work closely with Resound to make sure that their hearing aids 
and our cochlear implants work seamlessly together to provide the best hearing outcome for these what we call bimodal users. Use a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid in the other. Then in terms of lifestyle, you've seen with Canso how that we've been able to transform yeah, from a behind-the-ear product to an off-the-ear product and also going forward, we strongly believe that offering different form factors that make the product smaller, more discreet, that's fully implantable one day, that those will be important elements to help the acceptance of implantable hearing solutions. And then, of course, an area that we believe is very uh, promising for the future, and multiple speakers before me made allusion to that, is the use of connectivity to transform the way that clinical care is being delivered. So once people receive a cochlear implant, they actually start a journey of clinical care. Often in the first year, they will go back to their clinic anywhere between four times a year. Some people go back 12 times a year to their clinic. And of course, you can imagine that once we can connect from the sound processor to a smartphone, from the smartphone to the internet, that a lot of that care could be delivered remotely. And that's why we are so strongly investing in that wireless technology, not only because it allows the, the phone connectivity to pick up a phone call and to listen to music, but it's also the gateway for us to get to the internet. Yeah. And so we're heavily investing in that technology so we can really transform the way that clinical care is provided after surgery by using wireless technology in combination with cloud technology. We already have made our first steps there with Cochlear Link, and there's more to come in the future in that front. And of course, that connectivity piece, that wireless connectivity piece is so beneficial for our end users, but also we don't want to have the professionals losing out. So we've made also the, the check in the operating theater wireless. We've already done that. And we're now about to introduce technology that makes the programming that happens in the clinic also wireless. Today that happens with cables. So the child is connected with a cable to the computer. It very, can be very nerve wracking for the parents uh, that they're gonna be worried that the, kid wants to, that the kids want to run around. In the future, that will go completely wireless. We have a small accessory here um, that, uh, excuse me, uh, that will allow to be connected to the sound processor and the whole programming can happen wireless. And the audiologist also doesn't have to be tethered to their desk anymore because they will be able to use a tablet-friendly version of the fitting software. And then finally, of course, we want to make sure that we have the right products, the right implantable products for the right indications. That's one element in terms of, of what we want to do with, with hearing indications. The other element, as Dean also mentioned, is make sure we have the right evidence so that we can really demonstrate that the implantable hearing solution provides superior outcomes over the alternative of a hearing aid or sometimes no treatment, and that, that evidence will help us to drive future market growth. And so to sum up, we have uh, seen that over the last 35 years that product innovation was, it still is today, and we also uh, expect that for the future is going to be a cornerstone of cochlear success. We've seen that with the new slimmer dialer implant, with the cancer sound processor, that it really helps us uh, with cochlear to maintain our leadership and be the brand of choice. We've seen the same with Baja, with the Baja 5 product portfolio. And I hope that I've been able to give you some insights into Cochlear's product portfolio and the pipeline of new innovations uh, that is coming in the following years to make sure that Cochlear on one hand helps drive implantable hearing as a standard of care, and on the other hand, uh, and on the other hand make sure that our products are so attractive that we are, uh, or that we remain the brand of choice in our industry. Thank you.